The following video is made possible by Amino MTG. Amino MTG is a free social media app available on both Android and iPhone that brings Magic the Gathering players together to share their enthusiasm for the game. Amino MTG is the perfect platform to meet other players, discuss deck strategies, write or read blog posts, engage in real-time polls and chat, and much, much more. Come follow me at Heroes and Legends MTG on Amino MTG, and I will see you there. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to our Hour of Devastation pre-release primer. Now, quick word about this video before we get started. This is a sponsored video. Thanks to the folks at Amino, we're able to get an extra video out this week to all of you. You saw the information at the tag at the beginning, and I will say this. I don't get into sponsorship partnerships very lightly, and if I don't actually use and believe in the product, I'm not going to help endorse it. This is something I use. The Amino community has been amazing. A lot of you watching, I know, probably discovered me on Amino through my posts there. So shout out to all of you. Uh, but yeah, if I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't even uh, have that. But thanks to the folks there, we are able to get an extra video out this week, which I think will be like eight videos this week or something like that. So that's quite a bit. Now with that out of the way, let's get into our information for today. As far as the video goes, this is geared for players that maybe have never gone to a pre-release or haven't been in a really long time. So we're going to talk about what you need to know when you go, what you should bring with you. We're going to discuss the set at a high level. We'll talk about mechanics. We're going to talk about how some of the colors work together. And then we'll wrap things up by talking about invocations. So the big question, what should I bring? I get this one all the time. And here's the list of things that I always recommend bringing. First off, maybe the most important, pen and paper. <laughs> you go to a store, a lot of times if you're getting into a tournament, you do have to fill out paperwork. Like there's a tournament entry form, or if you don't have a DCI card, or maybe you had one but lost it, you may have to fill out a form to get a new DCI card sometimes. So there's a lot of reason to have a pen on hand because stores don't always have a lot of extra pens available. And I've even seen stores actually sell pens at events, which you don't want to be buying a pen. Uh, paper is good too to take notes, but what I would suggest, even though you are going to get a spin down life counter in your pre-release kit, which we'll look at in just a few moments, if you're thinking about playing competitive magic, I would get in the habit of keeping track of you and your opponent's life totals on pen and paper. That's really the preferred way to do it once you start looking at competitive formats. And pre-release is casual, so you don't really have to worry about it or do it if you don't want to. But if you are thinking about maybe playing in a GP or something later this year, it's a good idea to get in the habit. And if there's ever a discrepancy, that way judges can look back and kind of see what's been going on with life totals. Secondly, I think the next most important thing is sleeves for your cards. Now, a lot of players don't really care if their cards stay in mint condition or anything. They're just there to play and whatever, and that's fine. But I will say that if you've ever played at a card store, sometimes the tables aren't the cleanest. And by fourth round or so, and just shuffling your cards and handling them, they do start to feel a little grimy. And sometimes you have a hard time actually shuffling them well. So I think if you have some sleeves, especially matte sleeves, that helps with that situation a lot. I would caution you, though, have extra sleeves. You're probably running a 40-card deck, and if you don't have maybe 5 to 10 extra sleeves, if one breaks or a couple break for some reason, then you either have to buy more sleeves at the store, it's another investment, or you have to go without sleeves at that point. So I would recommend having some extras that are, of course, matching sleeves. Now, aside from that, some players do use the play mats, which is fine, and I would say if you're going to play a lot of tournament magic, I would invest in a play map because, again, it just keeps everything cleaner and simpler, especially if you're playing on dirty spaces. But you don't need it, especially just for a casual event. Again, it's just another investment that you don't necessarily have to make for the pre-release. Deck boxes, I think they're good to have. Your pre-release kit doubles as a deck box, but it's cardboard. It's a little fragile. I mean, it can still get crushed in your bag if you have other stuff in there. And also, it's really meant to probably last the day. Having extra deck boxes is nice because not only are they going to keep your cards more secure, but they're also going to let you divide things up if you want to have maybe cards that are tradables in a separate space or maybe you play in a couple events you want to separate your card pools things of that nature trade binders are also good too if you have a small binder and finally some dice and they don't have to be fancy dice like you see here i mean they can just be regular six-sided dice but just have a few on hand so that you can roll to see who goes first or perhaps just 
keep track of minus one, minus one counters, or just anything you need to keep track of during the course of the game. All right, here's the pre-release kit itself that you'll be getting. So when you enter the tournament, you'll get the kit. It looks like the box on the right. Like I said, it is a cardboard box, but it does hold your cards at least relatively well for the event. You get a spin down life counter, which goes up to 20 to keep track of your life. You'll have that achievement card that you see in the middle. Now, I'll be honest with you, when I go and I'm playing a set for the first time, I'm not too concerned about getting achievements. I'm more concerned about not losing. So <laughs> I'm focused a lot on the game itself. But it is a side fun thing you can do. And sometimes stores will even give prizes or rewards for people that complete certain aspects of the checklist. And now, of course, they're trying to promote other events through this one, too. So you'll a lot of times see that you'll be given tasks that you can do at other events, too. And then finally, on the left side, you'll see a small sheet that includes a little bit of lore just gives you some very very basic idea of what's going on in the set and on the other side they'll usually give you some tips for building your deck now the bottom portion are the cards you will use to build your deck you'll get four packs of hour of devastation and two packs of amonkhet you're also going to get one foil stamp date promo card that could be any rare or mythic rare that's included in the set so it is random but you can use that card in your deck building so when you build your deck that's completely legal so all the cards anything that comes out of those packs including invocations and or that foil card you can certainly use all right let's talk about what you can expect when you open these packs what mechanics are returning from Amonkhet and what mechanics are new so let's go through some of the returning ones first if you played Amonkhet you're probably familiar with minus one minus one counters and how they can matter well the trend continues although you'll see some changes in our devastation they're putting a new twist on some things. You see less minus one, minus one counters matters cards in green, maybe more in red this time around. However, you're still playing with two packs of Amonkhet, so keep that in mind. But there are times where having a minus one, minus one counter on something even you control can be a benefit for you. And there are other times where you're able to put these counters on your opponent's stuff. Next, we have Cycling. Cycling's back again from Amonkhet. Very popular mechanic. I like this one a lot. In the example here, you can cycle the card away for two mana. However, there's also some cycling cards you'll find in the set that you can cycle for just one mana on color, which is pretty cool and pretty economical. So watch for those. There'll be plenty of them in the set again. Eternalize. Now, this is a new mechanic, but it's kind of a take on an old one. So if you remember Embalm, Embalm basically said that if you had a creature card with Embalm in the graveyard, you could pay the Embalm cost, exile it, and you would get a token that was essentially a copy of the creature, but it was always white as opposed to whatever colors it was before, and it was also a zombie in addition to its creature types. Well, Eternalize is very similar. You would play it out of your graveyard anytime you could play a sorcery, and you will get a token, but this time, instead of white, the token's always going to be black, and it will still be a identical creature, except it will be a zombie, but this time around, it's also going to change its power and toughness to 4-4, four, four, no matter what it was before. So for the example here, two casting costs, 1-1, one, one, double strike cat with eternalize for two white and three. This time it would come back as a 4-4 double striker black zombie cat. So a twist on something you're probably familiar with for the most part from Amonkhet. Exert. Exert's back again, but this time there is another twist on it. You will find regular exert creatures like you saw in Amonkhet. And if you remember, if you chose to exert an attacking creature, that creature would get an extra ability, but then they wouldn't untap on the next untap step. Well, this time around, you have abilities that are exerting creatures as well as the regular just attack exert that we saw from the first set. So the example you see on the screen here, you can either tap this to deal one damage to target player, you can tap and attack with it like normal as a 3-1, or you can tap and exert it and it will deal one damage to target creature. Now, if you do that, it will not untap during its next untap step. So basically the same idea as exert, but instead of combat, some of the cards will actually exert through an ability. Afflict. Now, Afflict's a new mechanic, and it's actually a pretty fun one for aggro decks. Basically, the idea here is if something has Afflict with a number behind it, that means whenever the creature becomes blocked, the defending player will still lose that amount of life. In the example you see on the screen, this is an Afflict 1-2-2. Two, two. So if this does get blocked, say by a 3-3, three, three, even if it dies, 
the defending player will still lose one life because of the afflict one. Now you might see afflict one or maybe even afflict two or three or four. So take special note of what the actual afflict number is on each card. Deserts. Deserts are back again. Now, deserts were a very small part of the Amonkhet game. They're a much bigger part, and they're adding another level of complexity, I think, to the cards that you see in Hour of Devastation. Now, this time around, you have a lot more cards that are looking to see if you have deserts either in play or in your graveyard, or in some cases, both. So it's important to identify those cards if you have them. A lot of them are in green and red. And if you do, make sure you have some deserts to really unlock the true power of those cards. A lot of the deserts themselves will have some useful abilities tied to them as well. In this case, you can sacrifice a desert if you pay two and tap this. It doesn't have to be this card, but it can be. And if you do, exile all cards from all graveyards. All right, let's talk about archetypes. Now, a lot of times when you play sealed, archetypes are not as important as if you're drafting. I'll be the first to admit that. But I do think it's important to understand how the different colors are kind of meant to work together because you will find at least some limited strategies that fall within the colors in your seal pool. And it's real good to identify those and be able to build around those. So we're going to look at how each of the color combinations interact with each other this time around with our devastation being the bulk of your packs. We'll start off with white and blue. And this time, there's a strong Eternalize bond between these two. Now, there's Eternalize in other colors as well, but you're going to find a lot of it in white and blue. Blue is taking a bigger role this time in the zombie mechanic than it did in the past set. So you are going to see more blue zombies, more Eternalize in blue than you saw in Bomb, for example, in the past. Black, white, still on board with zombies. So not much has changed here. Like I said, there's other colors that are creeping into this territory a little bit now. But black and white are still very focused on zombies and how they can work together. Blue and black. Well, this is similar to what they did in Amonkhet, but with a little twist. Now, you found in Amonkhet that these two colors really were interested in you cycling. <laughs> and you'd have a lot of cards that gave you bonuses when you cycled or discarded a card. This time around, that's still true. But you're going to find a lot more discard, especially in blue. You're going to find cards that are looting or having you draw and then discard different quantities of cards. So there's a lot of opportunities to turn these abilities on through discard. Cycling is still an option. Remember, cycling is still available in all the colors, but you're going to find more ways to unlock the power of some of these cards through discard. Next, we have blue and red. And this takes more of its traditional spell-centric role this time around. One of the things that Amonkhet Blue felt a little more aggressive than normal. This set kind of brings blue back to its base. There's a lot of card draw spells. There's a lot of ways to dig through your deck. There's counter magic, things of that nature. Red is still very aggressive, has some really good burn spells like the one you see on the screen here. So in tandem, they want to play maybe a few extra spells than you normally play as far as instants or sorceries. But they also have creatures that are going to react well to those spells like the one you see on the left, Bloodwater Entity. Next we have black and red, still aggro, but with a twist again. This time they're bringing in a lot of afflict. So not only can you still attack in with small haste creatures and that sort of thing, you can still burn your opponent, but the afflict is really meant to carry across even more damage later in the game when your opponent does finally have blockers and is starting to stabilize. Black and green, minus one, minus one counters are still a thing. And I did mention at the top of the show that green is not quite all in on minus one, minus one counters like they were in Amonkhet, but you are still playing with two packs of Amonkhet. Red's picking up that role a little bit, but together black and green can still do some amazing things with minus one, minus one counters. Red and green, they still want to be down. That hasn't changed. In fact, maybe more so than last time. You're going to see a lot of big creatures in green, especially, and a lot of ways to enhance them, give them trample, things of that nature throughout these two colors. So, yeah, both of these colors just want you to play big creatures and just get in the red zone. White and red. These colors typically are aggressive together as well, and this time they have a sub-theme of Exert Matters. So you can see a couple of cards on the screen that play into that theme. If you happen to get cards like this in your sealed pool, definitely look for other Exert cards that can play well with them. Green and white. Selesnia colors. Now, a lot of times green and white try to go wide with a lot of small creatures, 
Now, that's not so much the case in Hour of Devastation. This time they're trying to go big with big green creatures, but the white is trying to run some disruption. So you're going to notice that the whole idea here is get big creatures out, then try to give them trample or tap down your opponent's other stuff so they can get across for their damage. And finally, we have Simic Colors Green and Blue, and it's all about ramp here. It's about ramping into some big, crazy things. In green, some big creatures. In blue, some big spells. But together, they can really pull off some bigger effects faster. All right, let's move on to Invocations. Now, if you're new to Tournament Magic or even just new to Magic, you may have heard of Masterpiece cards. Basically, they're extremely rare cards they're reprints in most cases of cards from past sets, although you'll find a few that are different copies or different versions of cards that are in the current set, and we'll look at those in just a few moments. Now, because they are rare, and you only will find one invocation in about every three to four boxes, so if you were to buy four boxes, in theory, maybe you would find two, but of course, that could be randomized. <laughs> um, so they're very hard to get, in other words, is what I'm getting at. And because of that, some of them do have a high price tag. And the reason I bring this up, especially to new players, is if you happen to open one during your event this weekend, be careful not to get into a bad trade, because there are some folks out there, unfortunately, that will take advantage of the fact that players might not know what these are. So they are very good cards. I mean, some will have more value attached to them than others based on their playability and such. But they are pretty amazing, and you'll definitely notice when you get one, because they look very unique, and we'll look at all of them in just a few moments. Now, the big question is, can you play them in the tournament if you open them? And yes, you can. Uh, you can certainly play them in your sealed pool, or if you're playing draft and you draft one, you can play it. It's completely legal. Now, the second question is, well, does that mean all these cards are now legal and standard? And the answer is no, they're not. Cards are only legal in sets they're already legal in. So if you get one of the gods, for example, which is in Hour of Devastation, then of course that would be standard legal. You could play the invocation version of a god in standard. But if you open something else that is not currently in standard, like Damnation, for example, then you could play that in modern, but you of course could not play that in standard. All right, with that out of the way, let's look at these cards, see what they look like. We have Armageddon, one of the first cards ever printed back in Alpha Beta Unlimited. Very powerful. I mean, if you get this in a sealed pool, think about how you can maximize your ability to put a lot of things out quickly and then wipe all the lands. If you're ahead and the lands go away, guess what? You're probably going to stay ahead. This is a very powerful effect. Capsize. It doesn't look like much, but then when you look a little closer at this card, it's actually really good. It costs three, but it's return target permanent to its owner's hand. That's anything. That could be their lands. That could really disrupt them. Now, for three mana, okay, that's fine. It's also an instant, too, but it has that buyback of three, which means that if you pay the extra three when you cast it, it gets to go back to your hand. You can play it again next turn, and if you have six mana, you can bounce something every single turn, really put your opponent back on defense. Really, really strong card. Forbid. Uh, this one is another card that a lot of times can create a soft lock and has in the past for magic because, again, it has buyback. It's a hard counter spell for three, but if you discard two cards, it goes back to your hand and you can use it again. Now, that's not going to be as easy to pull off in the sealed environment as a constructed environment, but it's still a hard counter spell and sometimes it's just good enough. Omniscience. Now, this is kind of expensive. It's probably not really a card you're going to play in sealed most of the time. I mean, I guess you could maybe ramp into it in Simic, but then again, you still have to have another good payoff for it. It is a card, though, that sees a lot of legacy play and is popular among legacy players. Opposition. This card is a beating. If you're lucky enough to open this, try your best to be able to cast it with the two blue because this is nuts. Tap an untapped creature you control and you get to tap down target artifact creature or land. So if you have enough creatures on the board, you can actually take your opponent off their lands and hopefully still have enough creatures to attack in with. This card gets insane fast, and sometimes it's just simply unbeatable. Sunder. Uh, this is kind of like the blue Armageddon. Instead of destroying the lands, they return to their owner's hands. That includes yourself, of course. But you know what? Again, this is all about getting ahead quickly. Once you're ahead, returning all lands to hands, and hopefully your opponent can never come back from that. Threads of Disloyalty. 
control magic effects are great in sealed. Like if you're playing a game of sealed and you get any sort of control magic effect, it's going to have a good level of power behind it. This one only costs three. It can only take small things, but you know what? In the sealed format, this could be a big board swing. Avatar of Woe. All right, this costs eight. I mean, sometimes it costs two, but that's going to be probably hard to maneuver in sealed most of the time, or at least until maybe the end of a very long game. But even so, at eight, is this castable? Depends on your deck. You know, I think this can be the high end of a curve, especially if you're in Golgari with a little bit of ramp behind it. Uh, but if this thing can hit the battlefield, it is a beast. I mean, six five with fear, which means it can only be blocked by black and artifact creatures, and you can tap it to destroy target creature that it can't be regenerated really really strong creature put out on the battlefield in a game of sealed for sure damnation one of the best board sweeps ever i mean based off wrath of god which of course was the first board sweep super economical you know you have this and your opponent doesn't probably for the most part which means you can play around it if you ever fall behind great way to stabilize really powerful card desolation angel uh, this one's a little weird. It's a 5-4 flyer, which is nice, but if you pay 5 for it, unfortunately, you lose all your lands. A lot of times you might not be in a position to be able to do that. But if you can pay 2 white, 2 black, and 3, then it just destroys all lands. And again, you have to be ahead to take advantage of that. And that is starting to become a pretty tough mana requirement. Not impossible and sealed, but not the easiest requirement at all. This is one of the cards that, know your deck, if you are lucky enough to open it, it still might not quite make it, unfortunately. But hey, you still got an invocation. Diabolic Edict. Uh, I like this quite a bit. First off, it's an instant. Target player sacrifices a creature. You're probably familiar with Trial of Ambition. Of course, it doesn't combo with a cartouche like that does. But the fact that you can do it at instant speed for two mana is going to feel pretty good. Definitely a good removal spell in Limited. Doomsday. Here's another card you might not play if you open it. It is very unique, and it does see play in Vintage. For a long time, Laboratory Maniac decks were very popular in Vintage, and this was a key part of those combos. So it definitely has its place in Magic's history, but it's a very risky card. I mean, you could play it, and in some ways you're basically tutoring for your best five cards at that point, and you're going to draw those over the next five turns. But if you can't win the game with those five cards, you're probably in trouble, and you're probably losing. No mercy. This thing is a beating if you play this. Two black and two enchantment. Whenever a creature deals damage to you, destroy it. Sealed games are mostly comprised of a lot of creatures. And if your opponent can only hit you with a creature once before it goes away, that's going to be a huge problem for them. Slaughter Pack. Great black removal. It's free, and it can destroy target non-black creature. However, your next upkeep, you do have to pay a black and two or you lose the game. So keep that in mind. But still, being able to tap out and have this open in case you need it, is still pretty awesome. Thought Seize, very powerful card. The most powerful card of this type of card, honestly. It is insane and sees so much play in a lot of places, modern especially. So if you happen to open this, congrats. I mean, it has a pretty nice price tag attached to it, but also on top of that, it's just going to be good for you if you're in black. I mean, being able to see your opponent's hand and just take a non-land card from it and make them discard it. It's pretty awesome. Blood Moon. Another card that's popular, of course, in Modern. And this is a card, again, you might not necessarily play. Your opponent will not have a whole lot of non-basic lands in a game of Seals. Now, I don't know. Maybe you board it in if you see they're really reliant on a desert strategy or something. But for the most part, this is just a nice pickup to have for maybe other formats like Modern. Boil. Well, it's a cyborg card, but if your opponent's playing islands, <laughs> they're not going to have a good day. Shatterstorm. There's not a lot of amazing artifacts in Amonkhet and Hour of Devastation, but there are some good ones, and I have played against decks where opponents have gotten a couple good artifacts. If you're desperate for some artifact destruction, Shatterstorm will definitely do the job. Through the Breach. A card that's pretty popular right now, and I think is going to continue to be hot and modern for a while. It's not a card that's going to be super great for you all the time necessarily in sealed, but if you do have some big creatures that are tough to cast, it's definitely runnable. Choke. Another card that hoses islands. Imagine that. So again, sideboard card, but if your opponent's playing islands, bring it in. The Locust God. Uh, here's one of the three gods, of course, from Hour of Devastation, and this is the invocation form. So you'll see all three of the gods 
also have an invocation and all three are good and i talked about them at length in the set review so i won't go into a lot more detail here but this one is amazing lord of extinction great commander card and definitely playable if you get it for five mana it's not as strong as some of these other cards in the world of sealed it's better in other formats but still very playable creature the scarab god Here's the second of the third gods. This one is the black and blue one that interacts with zombies. And finally, the scorpion god, the black and red one. So with that, those are your invocations. And I hope this helps you out a little bit as you go into your pre-release. A couple other things I'll add. Before you go, check with your store ahead of time as to if you need to pre-register or not. Some stores do have limited amount of space, so make sure you call ahead. And if you need to pre-register that, they can set you up. Also, too, it's important to find out what kind of tournaments they run, how many rounds, that type of thing, because different stores will do different things. Typically, they're four or five rounds. It depends on the store. Most stores I've gone to have played four-round tournaments, sometimes five. But every once in a while, you do see larger ones, and that might be important to you if you're thinking about a midnight pre-release. There's also different entry fees. Some stores will just have kind of your normal entry fee, some will charge you more, but have better prize payouts. So these are all things you may want to know before you jump in and just drive out to the store. But other than that, I hope this video is helpful. And let me know this weekend in the comments of my videos how you do, how your pre-release goes. I love to hear those stories. Hope everyone has a good time regardless and gets to go out and play a little bit. Until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.